So welcome to UMBC and to this special event. Uh, the event is Science Unscripted Conversations with AI Experts. I'm Keith Bowman, Dean of the College of Engineering and Information Technology, and we're glad you're here. Our college is one of the top US producers of computing degrees with nearly 1,000 computing degrees and certificates last year. Um, and our college is also a leader in many areas of diversity and inclusion. As one example, consider that we were the 78th largest producer of master's degrees in the United States, but we were fourth in master's degrees produced for African Americans. Tonight's event, Science Unscripted, is a conversation with AI experts. I want to emphasize that today we have experts. Last night, I wanted to see if I could get some answers even without the experts. So I asked some special friends that probably don't qualify as experts, but they were convenient. So first, I said, Alexa, what is artificial intelligence? She said, artificial intelligence is usually defined as the capacity of a computer to perform operations analogous to learning and decision making in humans. I then asked Alexa if she is an artificial intelligence. And she said something about imagining herself as an aurora borealis with surging charged multicolored photons dancing through the atmosphere. Clearly, she's been overthinking it. As that was her only answer, I asked her again and again because I actually had to write it down. I also asked what I feel is the always stressed out Siri if he is an artificial intelligence. And as usual, he has many answers. You can ask him again and again and he'll give you multiple answers. First, he said, it is a rather personal question. Then he said, in the cloud, no one discusses your existential status. So we won't do that. Fortunately, both gave the same answer when I asked about UMBC. They indicated that we're a public research university, which we are, but they did not know that we're also a very special place. I like to tell folks that UMBC is Maryland's nerdy chic campus, where it is cool to be smart, cool to study. You can ask our president, it's cool to study math. It's cool to also think about having a positive impact on the world, and we also, it is also a place with a very warm heart. A special thanks to all the panelists and the National Science and Technology Medal Foundation for being here and holding this event here at UMBC. Let's give them all a warm UMBC welcome. I will also note on this important night of the most important World Series for Washington, D.C. ever, that our next speaker was previously a college baseball player and a developer of baseball training approaches. Please welcome the executive director of the National Science and Technology Medal Foundation, Andy Rothman Noonan. Well, I really didn't know I was gonna bring up my illustrious baseball career. Um, certainly wasn't illustrious at all if anybody wants to Google it. Anyways. My name is Andy Rathbunun, as you heard. I'm the executive director of the National Science and Technology uh, Medals Foundation. Um, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, I know this is going to be a wonderful discussion about AI policy. Um, I do want to say thanks to a few people, a few organizations as well. Uh, thank you to uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, uh, you have a wonderful organization, a wonderful institution, so we're thrilled to be working with all of you. Um, I do want to say thanks to our sponsors. Uh, we receive a, a good amount of funding from the National Science Foundation, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, it's really their support that allows us to do these types of free events as well as live stream them uh, to audiences all over the country. Um, a little bit about our foundation. If, I'm sure many of you may not even know who we are, but uh, we are founded nearly 30 years ago, um, and it was based around a core belief that scientific and technological advancement are potent agents of positive change. Our mission then was to simply celebrate the women, men, and companies who are honored with the National Medal of Science and National Medal of Technology and Innovation, Presidential Medals, and oftentimes known as the nation's highest STEM honors. But really in the last five years, we've evolved pretty dramatically. Um, and we've evolved to expand a specific social imperative. Um, today, we not only st celebrate STEM excellence and providing access to STEM excellence, but we also advocate for the creation of inclusive, diverse, and equitable STEM communities and the tangible benefits they have on scientific and technological progress. Tonight, we want to take you into the deep, uh, take you into a deep dive into the world of artificial intelligence to discuss where we are in its development 
and how we implement and regulate this remarkable technology in, in a just and equitable way. We are excited to offer up this opportunity to have a substantive discussion about our future and artificial intelligence potential role in shaping it. Um, now I'd like to introduce our honored guest tonight. Our first guest tonight is uh, Cynthia Matuzic. Uh, Cynthia is an assistant professor of computer science and electrical engineering here at UMBC. Um, her research focuses on uh, robots acquisition of grounded language in which robots learn to understand how language relates to the real and physical world. Our second guest is Dr. Jose Marie Griffiths. She is the president of Dakota State University in Madison, South Dakota. President Griffiths has spent her career in research, teaching, public service, corporate leadership, economic development, and higher education administration. Our third panelist tonight is Candace Jackson. Uh, she's an attorney helping investors, product managers, and engineering teams make decisions about how to deal with the legal implica impl impl implications of data activities and smart city infrastructure projects. She's an advisor on privacy, security, automated decision systems, and consumer protection risks. And our moderator tonight, who I'm thrilled to uh, introduce, is uh, Rosario Robinson. Um, she's going to be our leader, our guide through tonight's discussion. Um, she is an innovative thought leader, a speaker, and global transformation change agent in technology and a diverse workforce. As a senior director, uh, women in tech Oh, sorry, Women in Tech Evangelist for AnitaB.org. She helps further the organization's mission for 50-50 women in tech by 2025 through stimulating storytelling, thoughtful dialogue, and advocating for true representation in tech. So if you will join me as we welcome all of our panel panelists and moderator to the stage. Thank you. Appreciate everyone coming out. Um, I want to start by introducing myself and then pass it on to my colleagues to introduce themselves and their work that they're doing currently in AI and policy and legal. Um, I uh, started out in, as an undergrad in mathematics and for some reason I ended up in computing. Um, I directly went into industry and loved it so well. but. I also found it, um, the research part was incredible. Uh, we were on a brink of a lot of new technology that was coming out. I was in the telecom uh, area at the time and went and got my graduate degree in mathematics. And so I've been in industry for about 25 years and my main experts in um, my technology expertise is in infrastructure um, and uh, been around the world. I've, I've probably visited every continent except um, probably Antarctica. And uh, technology has taken me around the world twice over. So I'm happy to be on this panel and leading the discussion um, with my colleagues. And I'll start with you. Thank you. I'm Yosei Marie Griffiths, uh, president at Dakota State University. I'm actually, um, by original education, a theoretical high energy physicist who ended up migrating into information sciences and computational science. I have been to Antarctica. I've been to all seven <laughs> continents. And if anybody nice. wants to ask me about that, meet me at the reception. Um, I've been involved in a lot of different aspects of information technology. And um, most recently in my career, I've been involved in policy development. So I was on the President's IT Advisory Council when we were looking at high performance computing and next, next steps in high performance computing. Um, I'm now on the National Security Commission for Artificial Intelligence. So artificial intelligence is very much at the forefront of the policy developments and policy debates that I'm engaged in right now. Hi folks, my name is Kay Jackson. I am an attorney and I help innovators with uh, the data implication, with the legal implications of their data activities, whether that happens to be privacy, security, artificial intelligence, smart city infra infrastructure planning, help you with it all, navigating it and you know, protecting your competitive advantages in a legal way. Um, how did I get here? Um, it was a long and wieldly journey from high school where I did a science and technology program and did 
that engineering focus to University of Maryland College Park, where I started off engineering, but ended up following a path towards multi-platform journalism and getting a job at a help desk on campus, leaving there, working in financial services, where I continued doing IT work, and then finally making my way to law school after realizing I was having too much fun um, and not challenging myself <laughs> as much as I could. Got to law school and realized that a lot of folks didn't really understand the IT and the technology side, and they were making some pretty weird Supreme Court decisions, and I didn't like it. So I started, to, <laughs> so I followed that path, and, and here I am today. Oh, all right. Um, Cynthia Matuzic, I'm an assistant professor right here at UMBC. Uh, I was exposed to artificial intelligence very early and then did my level best to do other things, majored in chemistry, uh, eventually ended up leaving with a computer science degree. And then I, I went to work for a purely symbolic AI research company uh, that was just a research company and ended up doing you know, research there for a number of years, getting steeped in really traditional, old, old school AI. Eventually, I decided I had to go to grad school because um, I had reached the stage where I was like PI on my own DARPA projects, and you're not supposed to do that with a bachelor's. So I went to the University of Washington where I completely by accident ended up in robotics and machine learning, which is a complete 180 from old school AI. Uh, developed my own sort of research approach, and now I'm here working on robotics and how robots can be human accessible, you know, use natural language to understand how to interact with people. Right now, robots are incredibly useful for predefined tasks and almost completely useless if you just put them down so that people can start using them. I've participated in a lot of kind of AI development panels and things because of my checkered past in different parts of AI. So, thank you. Awesome, thank you. So we had an amazing lunch with a group of local high school students, and they went to town with questions and challenged a lot of our panelists as well uh, about this conversation of artificial intelligence. So we're gonna have a more focused conversation around legal ethics and policy today Make sure you join tomorrow because that will be more on the technology side of what's, uh, what the research is like and who or what's happening um, with AI there. But I wanna start out by talking about, because this came up from one of the students and I think she was maybe a junior in high school. Um, why don't we talk about how AI is impacting and the maybe the possible misconception around job destruction due to automation? And Jose Marie, you want to start us out? I can start there and say this is not a new concern. It's <laughs> happened with every wave of technology that's ever come along. Mm -hmm. uh, jobs, some jobs do actually go away, but they create new additional roles for people to play. And so it's an evolutionary process. Um, I'm still waiting for the three-day work week. It's not going to happen. <laughs> We're working more than ever before. And technology just allows us to use our time and doing sort of higher order Mm -hmm. um, order jobs. It could be that artificial intelligence is able to eliminate a lot of the jobs a lot of people wouldn't want to do, and that's a good thing. So hopefully we can focus on a redirection and a reskilling of the existing workforce, as well as educating young people. Is, is this your class over here? It looked like your class. It's my lab. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, coming over and, and sort of coming forward with degrees in this area where there'll be new opportunities for you as well. Yeah. I think it's also important to remember that it's going to create more jobs and it's going to destroy. And there's been multiple studies that have come out that have, have come to that same conclusion. It's about whether or not we're, we're prepared for those jobs, whether or not we're teaching people to take on those jobs. It's also about whether or not we're taking an interdisciplinary approach. So this is one thing we talked about with the high school students um, this, this morning about how important it is for technologists, for folks who are getting AI-focused degrees, who are getting computer science, cybersecurity degrees, to consider how to use your lawyers, your marketers, your other business admin folks who are inside of your business, treat them as teammates rather than just resources. Because when it's a resource, you feel optional about whether 
whether or not you reach out to them to, mm -hmm. about how to design things. But when you treat them as teammates, you bring them in from, from the ideation phase onward, and you cre create a better product that's more marketable from, the, from, from start to finish. And then also, we talk about the importance of talking to your end users, whether that's internal end users or that's external end users, in order to really understand what people need. Because you could create something way cheap, more cheaply if you just go ask a person what they need or go observe what they need rather than try to guess what they need from your from your lab by yourself. Yeah. So we touched on this briefly, but I think there's a huge education component to this question. Um, a lot of the jobs that are being have have always really been uh, destroyed by developing technology and AI are typically things people don't want to do. Uh, that's that's what we build tools to do for us first. But that the, the country is moving towards a place where sort of more education is required for most tasks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's much harder now to get a degree or to get a job with a high school degree without, you know, at least some amount of college. And that, you know, that trend's probably going to continue. So one of the things that we really need to be focusing on is making sure that we're figuring out what people want to be doing with those skills and educating them to be, if not AI researchers, as I would prefer, at least like technologically literate and prepared to take on working with those technologies. Yeah. So you know, we all have our our um, our advocacy of what we want to do and how we want to see things, but. One of the things that stuck out with me also is that the high school students were also very concerned about losing control and privacy. And I think that's been such mainstream right now. Um, can you talk about that? Or maybe, you know, let's, let's, let's go work ourselves backwards here. I can talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> so the history of privacy and technology and particularly in machine learning has been rocky and weird. And one of the things that's happened is we've seen who is, is concerned about the implications and the privacy components and the long-term effects of putting yourself out there or being surveilled. Uh, that age is getting consistently younger and younger. So like 10 years ago, it was, there was a lot of, you know, kids will put anything on Facebook, they don't know not to, it, it'll come to haunt them. And now I think a lot of the activism in like let's keep some privacy, let's keep some personal rights, is coming from a much younger group of people as people get more and more concerned about those issues. And they are, they are very real issues. I think it's important that we consider that we, at least if you're from the United States and you, you know, follow the Constitution at all, you know that there are social norms that we put down in, into paper. We, privacy is one of them. And if we work from a place of respecting social norms, which goes back to my point of user-centered design and then thinking about your end user, then at the end of the day, if you create a product that respects social norms, it doesn't try to, net, try to treat them as like secondary or treat them as like a hassle, you can create something that's long-lasting, something that differentiates yourself in the market, especially today, because like everybody needs a privacy something. So if you can focus your research on how to respect people respect your end user as much as possible, then you're creating something that's going to be able to stand the test of time. And that's just going to be necessary because we see that at the federal level especially, and even in some states, it's really hard to move legislation forward. So you're never going to have a stable set of laws to work with. So what you can work with is the social norms we set up. Privacy is important to people. Security is important to people. Respecting good business is good, good, good important to people. So if you work in good faith to incorporate those things into your work, you'll find that you can differentiate yourself in the market and that your work is long lasting. Yeah, yeah I, I, I tend to agree. I, I think actually very often the argument is given, well, you know, we need this for security. Uh, here's privacy, privacy and security, sort of the, 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 the scales that you have to balance against each other. Neither is completely absolute, but there is a, a context within which um, we perceive, we each perceive privacy and we perceive security. And the further out you go, the further the influence you wish to have with your AI, particularly as you go from national and across the states to international, there are very, very different uh, uh, norms, uh, different uh, perspectives that people have on, on what, what uh, privacy is. And we see that even just in the mix of students we have come to our campus. 
they be have very different ideas on you know, whether you're encroaching on their privacy or not. If you put a camera, let's say by the cafeteria, um, our students one day were absolutely horrified that the thought of putting a camera by the, by the cafeteria uh, was impinging on their rights. Well, it was there because we were getting complaints of long lines for the cafeteria. So the idea was you could have an app, you could find out when the line is short enough, now is the time to go running to the cafeteria. But the actual reality was totally different. Very interesting. Yeah. So I don't, I, we, we had a conversation also about um, the capacity and the rate and speed that technology is developing as well. Do you feel that our policies and all the, the laws that are being created right now are up to speed or there's a lot of work to do? How do we kind of manage all of the policy side versus the innovation side? Because we, we need the innovation. Well, we like the innovation, but, the, but it is leaving the policy side and the legal side behind. I won't comment on the legal side. I'll leave that to you, Kay. But definitely, <laughs> we, we don't have a, a lot of policies in this area. And um, other countries are moving swiftly, making massive investments in their capacity. Mm -hmm. And we need to figure out, I think, in the United States what our position is and how we can move forward. But there are lots of different areas of policy development needs that exist. And policy is not easy, especially when you think about who's <coughs> going to be impacted by policy. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to sort of take all those viewpoints into consideration in order to come forward with something that's workable. The other comment I would make about policy is I've seen a lot of policy developed that is not implementable. And to me, that's somewhat of a waste of time. Um, so if you're going to develop policy, you should at least make sure that we can, we can implement it and monitor it. Mm, good point. Yeah. So I would say that Hicks Law is probably one of the most important uh, ones we can keep in mind. Is simplicity matters. I think that what you'll find um, as you all are moving into your field or maybe even now in your, in your research, you'll see that there are just a lot of laws out there that govern different aspects of your activities. It may govern what you're doing based off of like whether or not you're a health care institution, whether or not you're a financial institution, and it'll be different for both of those institutions and then it'll, some places it won't matter at all, even though you might be processing the same types of data elements or working with the same type of end users, right? So this takes me back to the importance of making a decision to do good faith business yourself. Because one, if you're creating something here in the United States, I'm assuming that you want to go global, right? Everybody wants to be a global disruptor of markets, right? <laughs> so you, if you want to be a global disruptor, you have to think about how you're going to be able to apply what it is you create across the globe. And how can you do that in the most scalable, repeatable way possible? There's, there's no law in the United States, per, well there is, there are a couple, but there's no widespread comprehensive law that says everybody doing business, creating artificial intelligence, creating some type of data usage uh, system has to consider security by design. There's no law that says you have to consider privacy by design. There's no system that says, there's no law that says everybody has to do privacy by default. But why not do that if you know that it can help you be a global disruptor of markets? Uh, and, and that's where you come in and being in school right now and being in a place like this where you are given all the resources necessary and you have friends who you can work with on projects and you can get those funded. Uh, this is the place to do that because it makes you more flexible. Larger companies are not going to be as flexible as you. They're not going to be able to change everything about their business and go privacy by default. They can't do it. Not as well as you can. So being acting in good faith, considering your end user, talking to people, asking them what they need, and then addressing that need, absolutely the best way to do your business from a legal perspective if you want to go global, because there's just too many laws for you to try to f follow. So the best approach is to be as respectful and be as, as good as possible. So to the original question of whether policy and lawmaking are keeping up with technology, um, I, I don't see how they could. Uh, there's two huge problems. The first is the pace of development in areas like AI, computer science, and the other things that AI touches on, mechanical engineering, copy, uh, psychology. Mm -hmm. Those fields are growing just enormously. They've been growing enormously for decades. The number of people engaged in them is growing. The number of students in those fields is growing. Uh, computer science departments are turning into computer science colleges. And the pace of policymaking and lawmaking is not right now at a place where it can just expand dramatically. Right? It's, we're not going to suddenly be able to pass a bunch more laws 
in any given unit of time in an informed way. And that's kind of the second point I want to make is that the quality of the kind of policies, laws, even the social norms that we want to consider uh, is completely dependent on the people making those policies and laws and what kind of information they're getting, what kind of advice they have, how well they understand the technology that they're regulating. And right now, that's an enormous breakdown. Like right now, the people who are considering making policies are reacting to AI as perceived through the lens of Google press releases, right? Which is not a terribly broad view at, at best. Um, so one of the big questions that I think the field is struggling with is how do we get that information out there? How do we inform the people who should be doing this, whoever they are? So at the rate of innovation and um, with the policy and the lawmaking lagging behind, that brings the question of ethics. So why is it important to inject ethics into developing AI and how will that help policies or the lack thereof um, going forward? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, I think um, uh, developing a, a having, having people develop a, an ethical approach is important. I think it should be part of all computer science mm -hmm. education. Um, in fact, at our university, I think all of our students should take, take uh, a course in ethics. Um, I think it's really important because of the difficulties we have in the pace of change mm -hmm. and the fact that technology is so ecumenical. I mean, it reaches so many people in ways that we might not be able to imagine yet. Right. Um, you know, we, we tend to think about the good in technology, right? When we read about new technology, we tend to think about the good. We don't think about all the things that it could do wrong. We don't think about bad actors all the time, although I must admit, now I'm into cybersecurity, I'm thinking a lot more about bad actors all the time. But it's, it's, you don't want to be sort of negative all the time. So I think that having a framework within which you can begin to look at new situations that you've never come up against and say, oh, this, this is the, the ethical approach, this is I don't know, the, the approach that my values say that I should bring to bear on this problem, and then merge those with the values of other people in, in the sort of teaming environment that, that Kay was talking about is the way to go. But I think if we don't have ethics, I mean, I think we, we're lost. Mm -hmm. We're going to be driven by this uh, push for function at the next best app, the next <coughs> best Sorry. version of a technology, um, and the money that it can generate, rather than doing good for mankind, or mm -hmm. humankind, excuse me. So I think there's two ways to come at that. There is from the perspective of do, doing good is the right thing, doing the ethical, the moral thing, it, that's the right thing to do, and we would like to assume that a lot of people want to do the good moral thing. There's another side to come at that, and some a lot of people want to just make money, and if you want to make money, that's fine, uh, but you can also differentiate yourself, differentiate yourself by doing the good and moral thing and, and making money. What do I mean by that? I mean that you have to really consider who your end users are. You have to consider who is going to be actually benefiting or negatively influenced by your work. And I think that having that close contact with the people who are doing your work, who you're, are going to be your end users, will actually help you, one, make a better product. So whether you're trying to do something morally good, which is maybe save the, save the world, uh, bring water to people, you've done the right thing by that user, the end user, and whether you're trying to sell something to somebody and make money, you've done the right thing to make the most money from that end user by addressing that person's needs. And, I, and the other thing I would bring up is that the only way to do that, and to do that in a real way, is to come and talk to them and to have a back and forth conversation. Because data is helpful, yes, but you should use it to identify problems, not to solve them. You identify the problem, then you go meet the people, and then you can, you can collect data there, then you go back to your lab and work. But then you go back and talk to people about it when you're iterating when you're trying to decide how to solve the problems, because you have to go back and forth. And even with ethics, if we're gonna bring ethics into your education, it's gonna be by the Socratic method. Uh, I study law, and in law, how, you, how do you learn law? You learn law by talking back and forth to your professor, because it's a gray area, and that's gonna have to be something that you have to deal with if you're trying to do something good and moral. Your values don't, aren't the only values that matter, so right, regardless of whether or not you think you're doing the right thing, you're probably doing the wrong thing for somebody. And so you have to accept that, 
If you don't accept that, then that's gonna be a problem. So first, accept that your values are not perfect and your values do not address the entire world. And then accept that whether you wanna do the good thing or you wanna make the money, you need to go talk to your users so that you can make sure you're taking into account all the values that matter. Yeah. So from an educational perspective, and I know I keep saying that, but anybody can be educated, right? It's not just you know, people who are traditionally students. Uh, one of the problems I think that we see is that we talk about ethics and about morality and about being good people. But in the context that people encounter it, it often seems very orthogonal from the technical work we do. Like, okay, I can tell you be a good person and respect other people's privacy. Uh, now go do this Python program that does a good job of playing chess, right? We often don't do a good job as technologists, but also as a society at large, at connecting our actions to broader ethical issues. So one of the things that I think UMBC does well is we require our undergrads to take an ethics class, ethics in computer science class. And I typically spend the first few weeks of that class just giving examples of, you know, okay, here's a thing that made news recently. What are the ethical ramifications of this? What does that mean to you as an information professional? And that's not always an obvious question. You know, you make an app that helps people find housing. That's great. Um, I know the people on the stage are already like cringing <laughs> the <laughs> possible ways that that can go wrong. But you know, for students and for people who are just, they're engineers, they're supposed to build things that work. Realizing that there's such a thing as, you know, protected populations and associated data. Like if you ask somebody what kind of food they like to eat, and it ends up strictly sorting people into different areas of town by ethnicity, you've made a terrible mistake, but at no point did anybody say, hey, are you, you know, <laughs> are you sure ethnicity isn't playing into this? It's just recognizing that aspect of all of the questions is not well taught, not well understood society-wide. Yeah, if I could jump in, I think what sure. we, in our conversation earlier, we were talking about it's important not to be afraid to ask questions. If you've got, especially if you've got the technical skills, they're not going to fire you because you've asked a question. So asking the questions about is this the right thing to do or what if and how could this be um, abused, we said all technology can be used and abused, I think asking the questions is an important uh, uh, practice to, to develop so that you're not afraid to ask questions. So I do quite like the Socratic method. Yes, agreed. <laughs> and if I can just respond sure. to that quickly, one of the things that I try to impress on my students and everybody is if you are someplace where you don't feel like you can ask questions or you're someplace where you feel like the answer is going to be we're making a lot of profit off of that, so that's not really your problem, let legal handle it, uh, your skills are valuable. Take them somewhere else. If you're working someplace that isn't respecting your need to get information, go. That's a deal breaker. Yeah, I think um, when I first started out um, as an engineer, uh, you know, one of the things I learned very quickly is that I am not building something that I think someone else likes. I'm building someone that you want to use and utilize. Um, and a lot of engineers don't like their jobs and their work being questions, but that's why you bring in the quality assurance to ensure that we are creating products for the users and not injecting ourselves into what that product should look like. So do you have an example of maybe a, an AI product or technology today that, um, good or bad, Right? If, if the bad, then, then why is it bad and how can we look at that and improve on it uh, with work that we're doing? And then if it's good, give us some indication of some of the work that's behind the scenes that we don't often get a chance to, to really look at as well. Anyone want to start? Or? So, like, I, I have lots of examples. Maybe <laughs> somebody else would like that's to okay. talk. That's okay. I'll let you go first. Um, so I can give, I'll try to give a brief example of each. Sure. Um, there was a very popular app, phone app, four or five years ago that was designed to help you meet people. 
And what it actually did is if you were, you know, in a public space using one of the apps that helps you, like, this person's here, do you want to talk to them, uh, you know, somehow get a name or a picture. And it would take that information and go scrape a bunch of information from that person's Facebook page, uh, Google results, you know, what school they go to, uh, Reddit comments that they've made on sports teams, and dump all that information in an easily digested format so that you could go up to them at the bar and be like, oh, you're watching the game? I love that game. <laughs> and, you know, kind of take it and do your best to convince them that you're the perfect person for them. And that's inherently stalkery. Like, that should really not come across as okay. Um, how many people would be surprised if I told you it only worked m like male to female? That's, uh, it's, it didn't work on men that you wanted to stalk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all, and the, the excuse, of course, is that's all public information that you could find. Uh, technology can make things easier that you shouldn't do, like too easy. As an example of a good use of technology that a lot of people don't realize, um, I'll just go like completely a different direction for a minute and say, uh, Siri has actually, I mean, Siri has its ups and downs, right? All the personal assistants have their ups and downs. Uh, but Siri is both pretty careful about users, very careful about users' privacy and the things that they say and ask compared to other vendors. Um, but also the team that builds Siri hopefully you'll never need to know this, has put a tremendous amount of effort into recognizing life-threatening situations and addressing them in some useful way. So there have been a number of cases of people who had, you know, fall detection turned on and took a bad fall and, you know, paramedics got to their location deep in the woods within half an hour, things like that. And that's not obvious, you know, you don't need to know that unless you're in a life-threatening situation. Sure. But, you know, you can set it up to detect gunshots. Mm -hmm. um. Thank you. So I think gunshots would not be very good in South Dakota because it's pheasant hunting season and they gunshots all the time. Well, one of the things Siri does right is lets you turn these things on Sorry. instead of letting you turn them off. off. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. So I'm struggling to think of like a good quality example, but I can start with something like a, just a field, human resources. So in artificial intelligence, a trend that we've noticed is that black people, people of color, either they're not like noticed by artificial intelligence or their, their, their inputs don't receive the expected outputs. So what you'll see is I think in the news recently, I saw something about uh, you know, some facial recogn te technology recognition recognizing all of the football players who were black as like criminals, even though they were just football players. Uh, and that was the only thing they had in common. Uh, and then imagine now you're taking this artificial intelligence and you're using it in the human resources uh, division. And you haven't used a representative sample of folks in building your and training your artificial intelligence. Now you have it such that the inputs from candidates who, are, who may have like signifiers that Maybe it's not that they're signifying black, but they're not signifying white. And that's really what it really comes down to, is like, I'm, my name's not Bob, and like all the great people at this company have been named Bob. Um, and, or it may be that like, I, you did not row, because apparently you know, these, these uh, signifiers, like the skills and like your interests at the bottom of your resume, they're signifiers of your wealth and your class. Like maybe I grew up in a neighborhood where there was no row team, there was only basketball, there was only track, and you'll see that African American folks in, will end up being in those type of sports because maybe their schools only are the, only had those type of sports and things of that nature. So I see human resources as a place where if we take, you know, these artificial intelligence and we slap them on there, we're gonna put in place and re, re like I guess what do you call it, reinstitutionalize the problems of racism, the problems of discrimination in, in hiring, and we're gonna call it objective. We're gonna say, oh, well, I used the, a, the data that I had, and I put it into the algorithm that I've tested, and it gave me only white candidates, so only white people must be good at this job, sorry. 
And then now we still have a racism problem and it's under the guise of objectivity. So I think that's a, that's a, big, um, a big problem and that, that concerns me a lot. And it's, it's one of those things where I think that if you go and talk to your end users a lot, you can help avoid that. So like say your company's doing a diversity initiative or your company's trying to help people connect with diverse candidates. Uh, what are you doing to go talk to diverse candidates plus talk to the employers in order to make sure that your product is actually asking the right questions or touching on the right data elements? These are the times where you have to go talk to people. You have to go talk to both sides of it. You have to do that in an ethical manner because you can't just use the black and brown people as your little test subjects and then not give them any profit or make sure not make sure they get any benefit. So these are the ethical concerns that I see like cropping up. Like how do you actually do good user-centered design without using people and exploiting them? And, and then how do you take that and translate it into something that's repeatable and that's scalable for your business? Can I just add on to, I'm gonna give a resource. Um, there is a woman, um, African-American woman, she's out of the Bay Area. She has a company, she started a company called Blendor. And she is using our AI for the complete opposite. She strips away any kind of knowledge, no facial recognition, no names, no anything. She strips away everything from your resume and only give uh, indications of skill set. And so she's got a few of companies out in the Bay Area, tech companies out in the Bay Area that's utilizing this and giving so she can re refine that technology away. So when you said that, I thought about her because that's a perfect example of taking a, a problem or something that's maybe no one's ever thought about and, and can certainly be racist against a certain group and taking that technology and flipping it and coming up with a better way to make sure that everybody gets an equal opportunity. So I just wanted to make sure you, the, the company name is Blendor, and you can read about her as well. Um, I think she was a, a MIT fellow as well. So um, doing a lot of great work on trying to build equitable opportunities with AI technology. So I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually just going to comment that um, if that, that interestingly enough worked to my advantage. I have a name that's a little bit, most people assume I'm Hispanic and male. Um, and as a person in, with, a, with a degrees in computer science and physics, people don't expect me to be female. And so people would set up appointments with me and I'd show up and they'd be stunned for a minute. Are you sure it's you? I'm like, yes, it's me. And, and then they were on the defensive. So you know, that can work sometimes. Um, but um, in terms of uh, applications that do good, I think there's a lot of work going on in uh, uh, mining the corpus of um, medical research literature, for example, to try and identify um, solutions to um, you know, problem sets and um, using that and applying the results to particular diseases or to population health, which I think is a new emerging area now that we can really mine a lot of data. Now, if you add the data from... Um, the electronic health records to the literature, we can really begin to identify um, much better solutions to keep people alive longer and healthy longer. So um, that would be my example of an AI application that's really doing a lot of good. It's sort of in the process now, but they're still mining away as much as they can. Awesome, thank you. Um, I want to, I want you, I want you to consider, um, there's a lot of students in the audience, but what do you want to leave with the students of, uh, or have them consider when you're building technology and you're using artificial intelligence or machine learning to, to really build that out? What do you want them to consider um, while they're doing this? We talked a lot about um, you know, the legal aspects of it, the policy aspects of it. Um, are there, just name one methodology or one kind of uh, perspective that they could take away with them? Um. Um, I'm doing a lot of work on workforce right now, workforce development, and um, there, are, there are two comments I'd have to make there. First of all, there are many different pathways to these newly emerging roles that are, that are coming about as a result of technological change. The second is that um, I think it's important within an organization, whatever role you have within an organization or an academic institution, 
the more you can understand how the technologies work, the better off you're going to be. So when we're looking right now, looking at um, workforce in the federal government, for example, it's not just that they need the sort of uh, the AI techies, excuse that term, the, the people who can actually develop the AI systems, but people who have to make decisions on how to use them, how to use them strategically, how it might um, change the direction of um, an organization and the work it wants to do. So all the way through an organization, some level of knowledge about uh, artificial intelligence and ethics associated with um, uh, developing and applying artificial intelligence becomes important. So I'll tell you mine from a version of a story about some data scientists who were working on a smart city project and the goal was to reduce traffic congestion in an area. They had maps and they were watching the data and they realized that all of the users were stopping at this particular point, point and it was like creating congestion, congestion. They couldn't figure out why. They spent weeks and weeks trying to figure out what was going on. They couldn't figure out there was nothing that should have caused this congestion. One day a police officer with experience in that area says, oh, there's a trash can right there. And that's why people are stopping um, in that area. And for, they didn't believe him though. They, they said, oh, there's no way a trash can can be there. It's not on our map. It's not in our data set. Uh, and so they spent more weeks working on this project. One day, the guy who was actually running their program comes in and says, like, well, what's going on? What's the problem? Well, you know, we can't figure out what's going on here. Some guy said there was a trash can there, but like, there's no trash can on our map, so we can't really figure out what's going on. Did you go look to see if there was a trash can there? No. <laughs> Nobody left the lab to go look and see if there was a trash can there, even though it was in walking distance from where they were. Leave your lab. Data can help you identify a problem, and then you can walk outside and you can go look. Or even better, listen to people with experiences. This police officer tells you that there's a trash can there, maybe you listen to them. So I think a big takeaway is it's really easy to, th these are complicated, difficult questions, with, and sometimes high impact questions. And I think it's really easy to either be like, mm, technology good, technology inevitable, or AI bad, <laughs> AI go jobs. And that's of course completely, that's a non-existent dichotomy. That's, we're building tools, we're using tools, whatever your role is with respect to the, these technologies. Tools can be used for good things, they can be used for bad things. And when you're building them, one of the questions you should always be asking yourself is how can this be used to do good things? But also, how can this be used to do bad things? How can I mitigate that? Sometimes, is this not maybe something anybody should be working on? Uh, more often, mm -hmm. it would be more useful to do good things with this if we build it in the following way. Um, it would be harder to misuse if we just don't put that data in in the first place. And if you've always got that running in your head is, I'm building a tool, what's it good for? What's it bad for? Um, it's, you can really steer the direction that these developments are going in a meaningful way. I think um, um, one of the things why I love participating in this is because I get to learn from a lot of the colleagues also doing a different set of work. And one of the goals I want to leave um, with this conversation is that don't stop the conversation because it is impacting us at a very fast pace, uh, very large scale, and we need so many of your perspective in this kind of new innovation that's happening right now. So that's what I want to leave uh, with you today, but I also want you to, how, how can this audience continue the conversation? If you have a resource that you want to, or a policy that you may want to share that they can look up because it impacts us. If you're on a mobile phone, if you have a car with all of these nice little gadgets now that can connect to your mobile phone, everything that we do is definitely going to be impacted and hasn't already. So um, I'll start with you. Well, I, um, I, you know, I, I mentioned I was on the National Security Commission for Artificial Intelligence. They will soon be putting out some uh, documents and some uh, preliminary reports, very preliminary. But over the next couple of years, we'll be fleshing out that report. So it's the NSCAI, uh, and you can look it up, um, a government entity. 
Uh, I think that the best resources that I can think of right now is IEEE has this AI and ethics um, like product that they put out, and it's very detailed, and it goes through a lot of the considerations that you might want to think about if you're trying to do ethical artificial intelligence. And then to the point of making sure that your, your work is user-centric, like take that work and see how you can you know, oper operationalize it. Like, can you do something in your in one of your classes here? Can you like do you have like independent study? Uh, I think we were talking about today about how we were trying to find an accessible way to get to this area of the campus um, from someplace else. Like, can you do something on campus to make accessibility a priority in terms of helping people find the most accessible route, uh, helping people figure out whether or not there is an accessible route to a place, and, and how they can get help assistance from somebody at a, at a front desk, like. That right there will require you to go talk to people. It will require you to go learn a little bit more about somebody who's different from yourself. They might be low vision. They may be like low, like have a difficulty with walking. You can learn how to do something like that very like s simply, and it's not a project that will cost you a lot of money because like creating the app, it, very simple. The process of it, the process of talking to people and creating something that's ethical and speaking to your subject in an ethical manner, that's something you can't just read out in a book. And it's something that you can test in small safe spaces like here, like we are. So I actually have two things. Um, sure. The Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, which is sort of the big North American AI professionals group, has very recently come out with something called the AI Roadmap. That's like, where do we see the field going in the next 10 years? And you know, what are some things that people should be focusing on? What are some hot areas of research? Particularly, what are some concerns? What are some things that could go wrong? Uh, what are some, you know, we talk some about making policy and the difficulty involved in making policy and making sure people are informed. Um, I think that's, it's slightly long, but I think that's a really useful reference document as well as a good read. Uh, the other thing I would point out, since I imagine most people here are local, is that UMBC cares a lot about these issues. Um, we teach a lot of classes on these issues. Um, I've gotten a lot of support in spending my time on building those classes, discussing these topics. Uh, if you're local, come talk to me. Uh, take one of those classes. That's what we're here for. I want to leave one more uh, resource as well, AI for all. Dot org, um, F O R A L L, and that's really an organization uh, by Fefe Lee, and she's out of Stanford, but um, she's really working toward making AI inclusive. So they have some really great practices there and get involved, um, and they're really um, nationwide right now, but really looking to expand the organization as well. So. I want to invite you back tomorrow because that is where a lot of the researchers, uh, we have a colleague here in the front who will be talking about um, uh, some of his, what he's done in recent, and um, he's at USC. Um, so make sure you come back tomorrow for the second half of the discussions. We do have a reception outside, so please join us. We'll all be there, and so we're, we'll be available for you to answer any questions, and I just want to Thank you all for joining us with this uh, AI discussion. Thank you. Um, OK, so we're going to take a few questions right now. Um, so in where are the mics? Do we have mics available? That, and some, I think we have a couple of volunteers. And you guys are going to use the catch box. Ah, we're going to do the catch box. <laughs> Oh, wow. oh, I get to throw out, and then they're going to ask the question. Right? They have a mic. I don't know. Do what you want. Okay. <laughs> I've never seen a catch box. I think box that one's for the audience. I've never seen the catch box. Either, it's just so. a mic. Just oh, give just it to audience mic. members. Ah, okay. Anybody has a question? I promise I won't throw, so. Okay, let me come to the edge. <laughs> That's safer. Is it on? It's, is it on? Yeah, yes. there you oh, go. Good. Okay. So you've talked a lot of things about uh, the state of the art, you might say, uh, about ethics and law. Uh, but I'm 
wondering if you can help a little bit, say, give us a point, uh, a pointer toward what to work on. Uh, for instance, many years ago, we had a big problem of trying to find enough computer programmers. So we came up with the spreadsheet. And it removed that need very rapidly. Uh, we had a big problem of trying to get documents around, so we came up with file servers. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if there are things where you might say uh, good computer scientists now can take away the problem of not having enough knowledge uh, for rapidly moving from one field to another for a, a worker. In other words, some, some way that they can look at a knowledge engine rapidly, get all the information they need. For instance, someone that wants to work in a lawsuit uh, can learn all the law necessary rapidly to be able to defend themselves. Is there anything like that? So his question is, um, are there any resources available where someone can scale up on um, AI information? So the limiting factor in how fast education goes is not the technological component. Um, people take time. I think a better question would be, rather than having the skills, or maybe not a better question, a question that I know the answer to, um, <laughs> better in that sense, uh, would be how can we make the information that people need to defend themselves in a lawsuit, you know, solve some novel problem, available to them in some real-time sense? You know, how can we, one of, the, one of the problems is not knowing what you don't know. You know, how can we give somebody who's going to defend themselves in a lawsuit a tablet that's bringing up relevant information, providing pointers as to questions to ask, you know, bringing up bits of legal knowledge that would be relevant? You know, how can we both detect what people need to know and get it to them in a usable, digestible form? That's a technical question. Um, and then as the lawyer up here, we are a self-regulated uh, industry, and we are not going to let you regulate us out of a job. So uh, <laughs> you must be licensed to practice law, and uh, only at t as of today, you must be uh, usually a human, a natural person, to be licensed to practice law. So I would argue that that iPad will be put into the hands of a lawyer, and it will make it uh, more simple for a lawyer to, to provide uh, more efficient legal services to people. Uh, because it'll bring up all that they need to know based off the facts of that situation and give them the guide, the guide rails they need to know in order to go look for different you know, contexts and different theories. And mostly because, like I said, we learned the law by the Socratic method. It's because the law is usually a gray area. If it was like cut and, cut and dry, then it would be like traffic court, and most things aren't like traffic court. That's why you have a traffic court and you don't have other types of court like that. So the point would be for you would be to figure out how you can make it uh, more cost effective for people to get the legal services that they need. Um, that requires you to look at from the two perspectives. Well, no, not two, but several perspectives. One will be from the perspective of the court, perspective of the attorney, uh, perspective of the law firm, perspective of the solo practice. Like, and so you have to figure out whether or not which one of those is your end user, how many of those is your end user. It's probably going to always be the court. It's going to always be the client, and then. Is it going to be a solo, a solo entrepreneur and things of that nature? And then that's what will inform how you do your work. There's no cut and dry answer. If there was, I would be out there uh, doing a billion dollar business. And if you want to team up on that, uh, uh, we can do that. Uh, but in terms of just being able to say cut and dry, this is how you find out about AI policy. There's just there's one. It hasn't been written. There's no. There's not a lot of laws in, in the area. I think Illinois has done some good work, but otherwise, there's just not a lot of law for you to know. It's like it's really ethics for now, and then also privacy and security considerations that are taken into account. And I, I was going to say, I was going to just jump on that too because it's such fairly new, and the policy and the legal have not even caught up to where the technology really is. Um, I know that there are some ethics groups that are coming out of uh, maybe Georgetown. I, I wanted to say something you know, local. Um, and then GW is George Washington as well. So, um, but that's a great question. Maybe we can take that back and offer some resources uh, to all those who've registered and then we can send out a you know, 
have the um, National Science and Technology Medal Foundation send that out. May I, quick, sure. cl quick clarification question. I took the question to be, how can we use AI to help people develop new skills as needed quickly, as they're doing things like transitioning jobs, rather than being about laws specifically? Mm -hmm. Is that, and I think they're both valid questions. Yeah. Um, I would also start with like AI for all, because they're actually trying to get, create like this tool kit if you will, on what are the specific, what is AI, first of all, because a lot of people don't know exactly what artificial intelligence is, how does that, how does, what is machine learning, what is deep learning, all of those kind of methodologies are there too. And I think the conversation for tomorrow with all of the technical um, researchers also will help as well. Maybe I could just say that I used to be a lawyer, <laughs> so I know the game. Uh, and I used to work in a public defender's office and there were plenty of clients that we could not actually serve. Uh, yeah. They happened to yeah. be in prisons and things. So those are the people that need a tool, mm -hmm. okay? But I'm also talking about those people, as Cindy mentioned, that there, there's tools that are necessary for, for instance, a factory worker to solve a problem rapidly. And they don't know all of the structures that they have to uh, unless they're very smart and they can get to the issue quickly. So Cynthia is correct in the, the, the interpretation of the question. Uh, the problem is that there are many different kinds of knowledge tools that hide information and in different companies, and that's an ethical issue. Mm -hmm. And the, the way to break that is to have tools that get that information to users rapidly. It's just that that's very difficult. Uh, Anyway. So I think in terms of addressing that issue, a lot of governments are working on open data programs where they uh, release a lot of government data about map, you know, maps and you know, just about how people use services. I think that's important um, in terms of the government being a source of information about problems people have in their lives and about how we can so uh, solve them and, uh, and the fact that the government is less likely to try to monetize the data that they have. So to the extent we can get governments on board with coming up with an interoperable way to release and clean and make quality data sets for people, that is one method for getting all the information that people need for, to solve certain problems. In terms of the educational component, I think one thing that we actually discussed earlier with, um, in, in our earlier discussions was about vocational programming and about how we've made uh, coding, engineering, uh, this, this art, artificial intelligence work white collar when it shouldn't be, it should be vocational, 100%. Uh, we've, I think we've also stigmatized vocational education. We, we make it seem as though you must go to college to learn these things, but really and truly, you don't actually need to go to college to learn how to do certain aspects of coding. Like maybe if you want to be the super theoretical guy, you got to go to college. But if you wanted to you know, just be able to do the, the motions, that's something we can start teaching from the ground up in vocational programs, and we should just bring vocational programs back in general, like HVAC, electrician, um, mm -hmm. a contractor, mechanic, because if you think about it, all of the smart products in the internet of things, do we really want people to have to go to college to be able to, to be the mechanic on the smart car? Like, that's not how we've done mechanic for, for centuries. Should we switch now? No, we should just bring back vocational. We reduce the cost of going to school by making sure that we shift it to the state where it should be in the first place. We have better workers, so better subset segment of the population is prepared to do the work immediately, which they should be, and they're also learning that baseline skill of coding, because I also think it should be reading, writing, arithmetic coding, and if we could get that in there, and then also add in vocational programs, I think we would solve some of your, your problems, because then the manufacturing guy, the person who's inside of the, the, fact, uh, the factory, and is solving problems, they have a little bit of those skills necessary to know whether or not they can solve a problem independently or they need to escalate it. Yeah. So there, you can, um, the open data initiative with the US government, I think there are tons of programs on there as well, that, and tons of data that you can access for free. Um, and they're volunteers that are working on documenting all of that too, so. Also, um, uh, micro-credentials, digital badges, open digital badges is mm -hmm. a, a good organization. You want to look at repositories because then it has some weight to it that it's not just something that somebody's put out on the internet. Yeah. So uh, I take a look at those as well. 
Awesome. Great question. Thank you. It's another panel. You want to catch it? Okay. And there's, and I, it's supposed to be a mic in there. <laughs> User centered design. Why aren't the instructions written on this box? <laughs> Nobody knows how to use it. Talk Not to the black part. <laughs> Talk to the black part that looks like a mic. <laughs> um, hi, so sorry. This is more of a um, technologically like focused question, but I was still hoping to get, get like your perspective on it. And it kind of comes in two parts. So um, basically, um, so we've obviously made a lot of like advances like with technology, especially recently. But do you think, how would you like rate how we were advancing? Do you think like now that we've like discovered and like started getting into this like coding and this artificial intelligence stuff, do you think we are advancing at a faster rate or a slower rate? And whatever your answer to that is, do you think the ethics of that is like kind of keeping up with how our advancements are coming along? I, I would say that we are advancing so fast that we just can't even keep up with, you know, getting skilled people to do the work. Um, and we talked about this as well, like, it, it, even if you all graduated tomorrow, there still would not be enough people to do this work. And so how do we close that gap between getting the skilled people and then continuing this advancement because it's just going to even move faster. And all of the, all of the conversations that we had earlier has, is still gonna be lagged behind because, because of that. And so how do we manage all of that? Um, panelists, do you all want to? Because we're still, I think all of us are like. Yeah. <laughs> so I think part of the question that you asked is have we sort of reached a point where the advancement is slowing or peaking? Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much like, um, right. obviously, like things are a lot different than they used right. to be like 20 so years ago. So I, I can answer that one unequivocally as an AI researcher. <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> it, we are continuing to expand and there are, we are continuing not only to develop technology in new areas, we're continuing to discover areas in which to develop new technology. Exactly. Like at some point, the rate of advancement in computer science will slow to something more like steady state, uh, like chemistry or biology, both of which are advancing fast, but not exponentially fast. In computer science, I would at this point be surprised if we see that in our lifetimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Good Very stuff, surprised. Yeah, that's one, uh, one back there, two. Oh, you, just throw you, can, you can pass it. You pass it. <laughs> All right, so I'll use this one. Um, so I'm going to kind of come at this from more of a mechanical engineering side. Um, we, in our curriculum, have an ethics class, I guess similar to the one taught um, within EE and computer science. We don't go into AI as much, but we do encounter the question of um, self-driving cars. And when they are completely self-driving, as in all done by AI, the question arises, all right, what happens when you're in a situation and it is unavoidable, somebody will lose a life, and the AI has to make that decision. Um, so w when in mechanical engineering, let's say I design a plane, it gets used overseas in a war. I wouldn't consider that I'm responsible for the ramifications, the deaths of those people because I'm so far removed, whereas in AI, somebody actively has to make the decision within, hey, we're gonna create this AI, it has to make this decision what are the ramifications that fall back on the computer engineers, the electrical engineers, et cetera, that go into creating that AI that has to make the tough decision? Um, that, and it, like, what are the ethical ramifications within that? So I was at a talk recently by a roboticist who heads up Toyota's self-driving car project, um, which was fascinating. And one of the things that he said is that the, the trolley problem um, which is sort of the class of problems where you have to decide who lives and who dies. Um, ugly, but whatever. 
uh, is, is really a thing that people talk about until they start getting involved in either self-driving cars or self-driving car policy, um, at which point you realize first uh, how many questions tie into that question. Like it's, it's very, very rare to be in a position where you're like behind the wheel of a car and uh, well, now I'm kind of thinking about it. I think I'll, you know, hit this car that's going out of control instead of this car that's going out of control. It's much, you're much more making moment by moment decisions about staying in a lane, not hitting things, uh, not running into pedestrians, not going off bridges. And, and those almost fully define how both people and agents solve this problem, right? We've got sets of routines that are, you know, if you're driving a car and, you know, there's a pedestrian in the road and another car next to you, you don't really have time to think about the, what, what are the ethical ramifications of this, right? You've got a baseline, like, hit car, don't hit pedestrian. Like, hit tree, don't hit car. <laughs> you know, you've, you've kind of got a lot of little decisions that add together into driving well. As for who has that responsibility? <laughs> humans. The grief that comes with taking your life should always be carried by a human. If you're gonna take away somebody's life, their liberty, their property, if you're going to harm them, you should have to, to own up to your decision as a human. So I think one thing that you hear a little hear a lot of and I hear a lot of is about where do you have humans intervene and pure autonomy do you really want to live in a world where uh, your overlords are the machines you created? Or do you want to live in a world where you the machines you created enable you to make better decisions about your own life, right? So I say that the grief, the guilt, all of that belongs to humans, and we should never offload that or outsource that ever, ever, ever. Does it belong to the engineer who created the algorithm specifically? I think it, it definitely belongs to you. I think that you are responsible for your creations. If you create something and it hurts people, it's your fault. I think that also the person who bought it and didn't vet it and just bought whatever you sold them is their fault too. But I think that all of you need to be working together to create a better product. And I think that it is going to be your fault if you cause a death because you created it, right? Do not outsource your responsibilities as a human. Yeah. All right, I have to push back a little on equating autonomy with offloading <laughs> responsibility. Because I think that's not necessarily a fair combination. But it's the result. So I'm, I'm talking about the end result. When you, and I think that now, you'll, you'll know that so, people tend to do this. If you give them a machine that says that it, it can calculate something for you, and that they'll end up relying on it more than they should. So I think it's important that we stress, and don't be too optimistic, because we had this conversation, sometimes you can give people the optimistic side. I think it's very important that we stress the negative side here. Do not offload this responsibility at all. I think this is one of those spaces where it's like, it's kind of like, you need to know. You are gonna make decisions about people who, they, they will never be able to advocate themselves, ever. And so you're making a powerful decision, and you need to own it, period. So I do understand that autonomy does not mean that you're outsourcing responsibility, but I do know that people will default to that, period. Cynthia, you, you wanted to say more about? Almost always. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Was that, was that? Did that? Yeah, that was, yeah, thank you. So you know, it, we have some very passionate panelists up here that believe, and, and I think the perspective is really important too. Um, and, and you know, that goes back to, there's a, there goes back to why do we have autonomous cars? So I'll do a follow on to that question. The, um, the public policy approach would say that autonomous vehicle driving would reduce uh, accidents by death 50%. Society gains, but yet to do society gaining, we're putting our hands in the faith of algorithms mm -hmm. and science. At what point do we begin to make the kind of judgments that say the greater good is better than the individual? Yeah. Good question. Okay. So 
I was just going to no, say no, you've been doing that all the time. Yeah. I mean, look at look at when when we broke the Enigma code. Yeah. We knew that some people would still have to die, or we would give up information that we had broken the Enigma code. So the, they they had statistical routines that determined who died and who didn't die. I mean, it. it, it uh, no, I, I agree with you. But that was back to the point of, as we think of some of these points, you're, you're pointing that we should keep people always in control. Um, if to the extent that there is some time, at least that's what I took away from the, the conversation, is, is that we should be very hesitant about self-driving. Yet, by the fact that people are driving, we often have people who are poor drivers. Oh, yeah. um, you know, we, we could think of certain classes, especially where this could actually be a much safer situation. There's, uh, that's the interesting public policy mm -hmm. space that this is all coming into. I don't think anybody here is arguing that, auton that putting our fate into the hands of autonomous systems is inherently bad. Um, my guess is, I think it is more a discussion of are we making those decisions in an ethical, informed way? And, you know, we, we put our fate in the hands of machines pretty much constantly. We rely on car manufacturers. We rely on medical di uh, prescription dispensing systems. Um, none of this is new. But that doesn't mean abrogating all responsibility for what happens as the person engaged with the system. Is that? Yeah, and it relates to transparency and explainability of, of algorithms, sort of understanding well, how the algorithm, algorithms function and informing ourselves a little bit about going forward how these things work. But, you know, and if and I, I don't think we have enough data or experiences to really say that, yes, make that claim. It can be. We make that claim because that's the hypothesis that we're trying to, to prove. However, how many cities are using autonomous cars right now? And, and we need to really learn from the data. And why do we have, is it just because we're built, we, you know, we went to hybrids, then we went to electric cars, is it more efficiency? There's a company called um, Zook that uh, is, is dealing in uh, autonomous cars as well, but their, their um, I guess their position is that we're really trying to eliminate a lot of the traffic, especially in urban areas where there's very little movement for traffic, especially if you have a city like New, uh, New York or Los Angeles or something like that. So it, so it goes back to also the ethics of doing that first, but I don't think we are there just completely yet, and this just takes time. Just like all of the other technology that we have, um, you know, that we've experienced as well. So I got time. I got time for one more question. Yes, in the red. You get the box and the mic. <laughs> There's some confusion about how to use these it's objects. Uh, you mentioned that when we are developing something, we should think of the good usage and bad usage of something, uh, and somehow related to previous questions. Uh, what is the criteria to decide whether this one, the, the thing that we are developing is good or not? Because, like, imagine a knife. It can be used for killing someone, or, like, surgeons can use them to heal people. So if you are the person that's designing the knife, are you going to design it, or are you going to throw it away because it's going to kill people? The, the important thing in my opinion, is that you are constantly evaluating what it could and couldn't be used for. Knives are a very general purpose tool. Most tools lean one way or the other. Most tools, you know, if you're developing robots that can shoot people, the good uses for those are pretty limited compared to the potential bad uses, right? It's not always like, but more to the point, independent of how you evaluate it, and I'd love to have a long discussion about how you evaluate it, the question is, can you, as the designer, say, it's just the knife, I'm done, not my problem, and the answer is no. <laughs> no, you, as the designer, must keep those questions in mind always. That's true of self-driving cars, too, actually. Mm -hmm. um, did either of you want to? Did, did you have anything? Yeah. I, I, 
for, for my perspective, I think um, just you really need to make sure that in every instance that you're trying to prove what you're building it for, that you have something why it didn't work in the first place or what scenario would be that someone would use it for something else. It goes all back to you want to do something very positive and you want to solve these really big solutions, but at what cost? Is that, is that good? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. This was a vibrant conversation Thanks. and we appreciate it. I want to give it up for our volunteer over there. Thank you. And please join us right outside. We have a reception. Uh, we all will be available for any questions and more conversations. Thank you.